Good morning. It's a pleasure to welcome you to San Diego State University for the first lecture in the San Diego celebration of the 2010 Kyoto Prize, made possible through the generosity and the vision of the Inamori Foundation. Dr. Inamori, it is an honor to have you once again visiting San Diego State University. The Kyoto Prize Symposium is a two-day celebration of the lives and works of extraordinary innovators, scholars, and artists who are recipients of the Kyoto Prize, Japan's highest private award for lifetime achievement. The Kyoto Prize is presented annually by the Inamori Foundation to individuals and groups worldwide in three categories advanced technology, basic sciences, and arts and philosophy. In conducting this symposium jointly with the University of San Diego and the University of California, San Diego, San Diego State hopes to provide an opportunity for an international audience to learn about the achievements of these remarkable Kyoto laureates. They are truly global treasures. We are grateful to Dr. Inamori and the Inamori Foundation for sharing them with us and providing this occasion to contemplate the connection between these laureates' extraordinary accomplishments and our common quest for peace and harmony. Before we begin the presentation portion, portion of this event, I would like to take a moment to reflect on the devastation in Japan. Allow me to quote a wise Buddhist priest. Suffering is actually the ultimate opportunity to hone our true nature. People who can see tests as opportunities are able to make their limited time on earth their own. In the long run, misfortune does not last for people who are sincere and willing to help others. And prosperity does not stay with those who are lazy and indifferent. Humankind should approach life in no other way than with this spirit of diligence. In the chaos of today's world, people are struggling to find their way through a dark night. Yet I cannot help envisioning a bright future filled with hope. That wise Buddhist priest was Kazuo Inomori, whom we are about to honor. Our thoughts are with the individuals who are suffering in Japan. And we remember the Japanese citizens who met untimely deaths as a result of this natural disaster. Would you please join me in a moment of respectful silence? Thank you. Please welcome San Diego State University's Vice President for Research and Graduate Dean, Dr. Thomas Scott. Good morning. We, before we begin our program this morning, I would like to introduce several of the distinguished guests who have joined us. Uh, let me begin with Dr. Shinya Yamanaka, the laureate, Kyoto laureate in uh, advanced technology from whom you will be hearing more this morning. Also, Dr. Laszlo Lavage, who is the Kyoto laureate in basic sciences, who will give his lecture <laughs> this afternoon at the University of California at San Diego. I would also like to recognize Mr. William Kentridge, who is the Kyoto laureate in arts and philosophy. Uh, he could not join us this morning because he's doing an interview with KPBS right now. Uh, next, several directors from the Inamori Foundation, which of course awards the Kyoto Prize. Mr. Toyomi Inamori. Mr. Inamori, please stand. Mr. Kaz Umamora. Mr. Kiyohiko Kagoshi.
and Mr. Haruo Tanaka. The Honorable Junichi Ihara, Consul General of Japan to Los Angeles and the Southwestern United States. And leading our symposium efforts in the community are Mr. Rodney, Rodney Lanthorne, President and Chairman of the Board of Kyocera Communications. Rodney. And Mr. Robert Horseman, Regional Chairman of the U.S. Bank. From San Diego State University, I would like to recognize Ms. Sally Rausch, Vice President for Business and Financial Affairs. And Dr. James Kitchen, Vice President for Student Affairs. And finally, I would like to recognize the extraordinary San Diego State University graduate students who were the recipients of the 11 uh, Inamori Fellowships that were awarded this year. You should be, please stand. Mm -hmm. These students were selected from 180 applicants uh, for these awards, and each has received a fellowship from uh, the Inamori Foundation. And now it is my honor to introduce to you the president of the Inamori Foundation, founder and chairman of Kyocera Corporation, uh, Dr. Kazuo Inamori, and his wife, Mrs. Asako Inamori. Please, Inamori Sensei. We have two extraordinary events to celebrate this morning, and the first is the conferral of an honorary doctorate degree of sciences on Dr. Inamori. This will be the only honorary doctorate degree that San Diego State awards in 2011, and I would like to take a moment to recite for you some of the achievements uh, in Dr. Inamori's career that uh, justifies and warrants the conferral of this degree. Let me offer a brief background to begin. Dr. Kazuo Inamori was born in Kagoshima, Japan in 1932. He graduated from Kagoshima University in 1955, moved to Kyoto, and in 1959, at the age of 27, he founded the Kyoto Ceramics Company, now Kyocera. Kyocera now has annual sales of some $13 billion and employs 6,000 people worldwide. In 1984, Dr. Inamori founded KDDI, a telecommunications giant now larger by sales than Kyocera itself. That same year, he created the Inamori Foundation to recognize lifetime achievements in major, of major contributors in technology, science, and the arts and philosophy. Dr. Inamori served as chairman of Kyocera until 1997, when he assumed the title of founder and chairman emeritus. He then created and served as president of Saiwajuki, which in its kanji characters means growth of business, harmony among humans, a school through which Dr. Inamori has taught his management philosophy to 6,200 entrepreneurs throughout and beyond Japan. Also in 1997, Dr. Inamori entered the Buddhist priesthood at the Empukaji Temple in the Rinzai sect. Six years later, he founded Sewa Social Welfare Association, dedicated to caring for abused, neglected, and orphaned children. In 2010, Dr. Inamori was asked by the Japanese government to serve as chairman of Japan Airlines to bring that company through bankruptcy proceedings. And as we just learned at breakfast, that occupies about 40 hours a week of Dr. Inamori's spare time. He serves this role while continuing to monitor the central operations of his companies, of his foundation, and while pursuing the passions of education through Sewajuki and religion through Rinzai that are born of his humanist philosophy. Now let me summarize some of the scientific contributions that Dr. Inamori has made through his career. Dr. Inamori is a specialist in fine ceramics. Today, Kyocera's products surround us, from kitchen implements to office equipment, industrial tools, fiber optics, joint replacements, solar cells, cell phones, calculators, wristwatches, cameras, jet engines, and the Mars rovers. 
to categorize some of Dr. Inamori's achievements uh, over the decades, let me start with the 1960s and television. During this period in the 60s when television was for the first time becoming a widely commercially available product, manufacturing costs were high and the processes for mass production were just then being invented. Dr. Inamori developed Forsterite ceramics with the ideal properties for housing and insulating the high voltage television components. His invention permitted Japanese companies to capture the bulk of the world market in television production over the next 20 years. In the late 60s and into the 1970s, microprocessors. Silicon Valley invented solid state processors, but moving them from the laboratory to the market required housing them in such a way as to protect the delicate wafers, integrate them, and connect them with external circuitry. Dr. Inamori conceived of a heat dissipating semiconductor package based on layers, now numbering more than 100 in a six millimeter pile, and multiple connections among them, now numbering more than a million per chip. This technology was adopted by IBM, Texas Instruments, Motorola, Intel, National Semiconductor, AMD, and others, and it permitted the integration of individual chips into the powerful microprocessors that we know today. His invention transformed Silicon Valley from a hotbed of research into an economic powerhouse and was integral to bringing about the information age. Into the 1970s, solar energy. Even before the first oil shock of 1973, Dr. Inamori foresaw the need to generate renewable energy to replace this finite and despoiling source of energy that we had in oil. Kyocera manufactured the first mass-produced photovoltaic cells in 1978. Others joined the field, but when, in 1981, oil began its 18-year price decline, others abandoned the field as economically unfeasible. Maintaining his long perspective, Dr. Inamori carried on with his research and production in this unwelcoming environment, making no profit for the next 20 years, but reducing manufacturing costs per watt by 97%. Now Kyocera has an annual manufacturing capacity of nearly a gigawatt, enough to power about 300 additional homes each year. And in the 1980s, telecommunications. NTT, Nippon Telegraph and Telephone, was Japan's telecommunications monopoly, much like at and in the United States at that time. The industry was deregulated in the early 1980s. Dr. Inamori had been distressed by the high cost of communication within Japan, and having taken my first trip to Japan in 1979, I was also amazed at the high cost of communicating within Japan and back to the United States. And this point was driven home to Dr. Inamori as he called back from foreign countries to Japan at a fraction of the cost that it took to make a call out of Japan. As a challenge to NTT, Dr. Inamori founded Dainidenden, which literally means the second telephone company, in 1984. Two other companies joined the competition and each had a presumed advantage. One had easements for their communication lines along Japan's highways, the other along Japan's extensive railway lines. Dr. Inamori outflanked them both by leaping to wireless communications using the emerging CDMA technology that was be de being developed at Qualcomm Corporation. Dr. Inamori subsequently absorbed his rivals into KDDI, now Japan's second largest telecommunications company with annual sales of $37 billion. Some of Dr. Mori's, in Dr. Inamori's philosophies. First and foremost among his philosophies are respect the divine and love people. Secondly, provide opportunities for the material and intellectual growth of all employees and through our joint effort, contribute to the advancement of society and humankind. Thirdly, don't pursue profit, let it follow you. Think of that in our society. Fourth, think about the other party in all business interactions and be certain your actions are fair to them. Fifth, use creativity to achieve continuous improvement. And sixth, 
work harder than anybody else. The mantra that one will hear as one moves around the Kyocera environment is Dr. Inamori's demand check everything twice. When you get a Kyocera product, it will work. Finally, let me mention a few items about Dr. Inamori's involvement with San Diego and with San Diego State University, including the following, though it's not an exhaustive list. Dr. Inamori established his international headquarters of Kyocera in San Diego in the 1980s. He is the chief sponsor of the Japanese American Friendship Garden in Balboa Park. He's an honorary citizen of San Diego and received the Civic Leadership Award from the San Diego Economic uh, Development Corporation in 2007. He has provided nearly half a million dollars in academic scholarships for college-bound students from San Diego and Tijuana and an additional 50,000 that we saw presented to this year's group of extraordinary high school uh, graduating uh, high school seniors at last night's gala affair. He provides support annually for the Kyoto Prize Symposium in San Diego that we're celebrating here today, and he contributes funds each year to support the graduate Inamori Fellows to whom I just introduced you at San Diego State University. And then some of the recognition that Dr. Inamori has received in recent years. He is a foreign member of the US National Academy of Engineering. He's a foreign member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering. He was awarded the Andrew Carnegie Mellon uh, uh, Medal in Philanthropy in 2003. Dr. Inamori was the subject of a 39-page case study in entrepreneurship at the Harvard Business School in 2009. He's a trustee emeritus of the Carnegie Institute in Washington. He has, he has twice been named Japan's most respected living entrepreneur by vote of Japanese executives. And he was named the Entrepreneur of the World in 2009 by the World Entrepreneurship Foundation in Lyon, France. Dr. Inamori has received a variety of honorary degrees from distinguished universities, a series to which we are honored to add one this morning. Dr. Inamori and President Weber, would you please join me? Let me say a few words about why institutions of higher education, such as San Diego State University, confer honorary doctorates. As you might suspect, it is not because recipients either need or seek further recognition. We confer honor do honorary doctorates for two selfish reasons. First, we want to associate our university with the achievements of the candidate. Second, we offer this candidate and his accomplishments as a model for our students to consider as they continue the process of inventing their lives. Would you read the citation, please? Yes. The citation for Dr. Inamori's degree reads as follows. Visionary, entrepreneur, and philanthropist Dr. Kazuo Inamori has advanced the Japanese ceramics and telecommunications industries while developing a unique management style based on personal improvement and commitment to the greater good. Not only has Dr. Inamori led his companies to success, he has also wrested market share from larger and more established competitors. Each of his corporations, now known as Kyocera Corporation and KDDI Corporation, grew to trillion yen enterprises with a global reputation for innovation and leadership. He graduated from Kagoshima University in 1955 with a degree in engineering. Joining a small insulator manufacturer, he helped create products in the new field of special ceramics. At the age of 27, Dr. Inamori established Kyoto Ceramic Company, Kyocera, which generated sales of 26 million yen and operating income of 3.2 million yen during its first year. 
In developing the, cer the ceramics that enabled containment of high voltage required for TV, Kyocera played a major role in bringing the television production industry from the US to Japan. While leading Kyocera, Dr. Inamori also developed an organizational structure for promoting full participation management in the success of his companies. The Kyocera philosophy is based on improving oneself, learning from elders, a higher purpose in life. In combination with innovative product design and efficient manufacturing, the Kyocera philosophy carried the company through five successful decades of diversification, globalization, and acquisition. 25 years after he established Kyocera, in the midst of the deregulation of Japan's telecommunications industry, Dr. Inamori created KDDI. It was the smallest of three competitors to challenge the, the giant Nippon Telegraph and Telephone Corporation, but within three years, KDDI had become the only viable alternative as a long-distance provider in Japan. In 1984, Dr. Inamori made a personal endowment to establish the nonprofit Inamori Foundation. He also created the Kyoto Prize, an international award presented by the Inamori Foundation each year to individuals and groups who have made outstanding contributions to the betterment of the global community. The prize is presented in three categories, advanced technology, basic sciences, and arts and philosophy. Since 2004, the winner of the Advanced Technology Award has lectured as part of the award ceremony at San Diego State University. In recognition of his business acumen, exemplary leadership, and philanthropic activity, the Board of Trustees of the California State University and San Diego State University are proud to confer on Dr. Kazuo Inamori the honorary degree of Doctor of Science. I am, I am pleased that San Diego State University is able to honor Dr. Inamori in this special way. On the recommendation of the faculty, and on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the California State University, I hereby award you the degree Doctor of Sciences, honoris causa, with all the honors, rights, and privileges pertaining thereto. Congratulations. Dr. Inamori. Today, I'm going to be a great honor 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 to be a great honor. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to San Diego State University for bestowing on me today an honorary doctorate of engineering. Thank you for your, from my bottom of my heart. San Diego State University is the first place in the symposium. We have enjoyed a long, wonderful relationship with San Diego State since the university began co-hosting the Kyoto Prize Symposium. Thanks to the continuing support of the university, and especially President Weber, the symposium has grown into a major event for the citizens of San Diego. え、本来であれば私の方から感謝を申し上げる申し上げるべきところでありますが、大変恐縮をいたしておりますが、今回このような名誉ある学位を頂戴いたしましたことは妨害の喜びであり。I'm truly humbled today because it is I who I should be expressing my deepest appreciation to you for your contribution to the symposium. I'm extremely honored to receive this degree. This is certainly one of the most memorable events of my life. Please 
Please allow me once again to extend my sincerest appreciation to President Weber and everyone associate, associated with the university. I wish you continued success in all of your activities. Thank you very much. And now we can move to the celebra second celebration of the morning, which is the recognition of Dr. Shinya Yamanaka as the Kyoto Prize Laureate in Advanced Technology. Uh, to give you an appreciation for the Kyoto Prize itself, we have prepared a short video, which we will now show. The 26th Annual Kyoto Prize Award Ceremonies took place in Kyoto on November 10th, 2010. The 2010 Prize Laureate in Advanced Technology is medical scientist Dr. Shinya Yamanaka. Mathematician Laszlo Lovaz is the Basic Sciences Laureate, and 2010 Laureate in Arts and Philosophy is the visual artist William Kentridge. The Kyoto Prize is Japan's highest private award for global achievement. It is given each year by the Inomori Foundation, which was founded in 1984 with the initial private funds of Dr. Kazuo Inomori, founder and chairman emeritus of Kyocera Corporation. Human beings have no higher calling than to strive for the greater good of humanity and society. The foundation awards three prizes annually in the following fields. Advanced technology, including electronics, bio and medical technology, material science and engineering, and information science. Basic sciences, including biological, mathematical, earth and planetary sciences, astronomy and astrophysics, and life sciences. And arts and philosophy, music, arts, painting, sculpture, craft, architecture, design, theater, cinema, thought, and ethics. At the commemorative lectures, the laureates discuss their life philosophies, worldviews, and achievements. In addition, expert workshops are conducted while educational programs for youth provide opportunities for interaction between laureates and the young men and women who will lead the next generation. The Kyoto Prize Symposium is also held in San Diego, California to share the ideas of prize laureates across the globe. The philosophy of the Inamori Foundation aims for a future with the proper balance between the development of science and civilization and spiritual maturity, with the goal to contribute to peace and prosperity of humanity. This is the core mission of the Kyoto Prize. By the way, that was just long enough for me to change. Um, yeah. An Doc honorary degree doesn't count unless you give it an academic regalia, but it's no way to go through a day. Uh, and now we have uh, a brief video about uh, the background and the life of uh, Dr. Shinya Yamanaka, which we will now show. Dr. Shinya Yamanaka was born in Osaka, Japan in 1962 where his parents ran a small sewing machine parts factory. As a young boy, he loved handling the machines, but was better at disassembling items than returning them to their original state. Throughout his school years, he enjoyed sports, including judo and rugby, suffering more than 10 fractures along the way. After earning an MD and PhD, and inspired by his personal experience, Dr. Yamanaka decided to study orthopedic medicine. After treating patients suffering with rheumatoid or spine injuries, he was determined to research and elucidate the real cause for those diseases and injuries. His research focused on the human body's somatic cells, specifically how to reprogram the somatic cells back to their original state, closer to the fertilized egg state 
which he believed could be used for the treatment of disease and injury. Dr. Yamanaka's studies and innovative research at the UCSF Gladstone Institute, the Nara Institute of Science and Technology, and Kyoto University have led to groundbreaking discoveries in stem cell medicine, specifically as an alternative to using embryonic stem cells. In 2006, Dr. Yamanaka discovered that it takes only four genes to reprogram cells without the use of any eggs or embryos. He then succeeded in creating pluripotent cells that can transform into any mouse cell by introducing these four genes into mouse dermal fibroblast cells. Dr. Yamanaka named these cells induced pluripotent stem cells. The following year, he generated iPS cells from human fibroblast using a similar technique. News of his success immediately spread throughout the world. These iPS cells can be changed to any kind of somatic cells, and this groundbreaking technology is expected to make significant contributions to a wide range of rapid progress in medical science. Currently, Dr. Yamanaka is the director of the Kyoto University Center for iPS Research and Application, which was established last April. His goal continues to be to help patients and the centers focus on using iPS cells to elucidate the causes of diseases, develop new therapies, improve efficiency in drug development, and expand the potential for regenerative medicine. Dr. Yamanaka and his wife, also a medical doctor, have two daughters. Dr. Yamanaka's message to young people is, don't try to mimic others. It is important to have a vision and an open and unbiased mind. As you challenge new things, you have to have a clear goal. Patience and work hard. We are massive, complex, and highly organized biological creatures each of us composed of about 60 trillion cells of about 300 different types. The instructions for making all of that mass and complexity had to be contained in the first fertilized ovum that began it all. And in fact, in one of the greatest demonstrations of the profligacy of nature, the instructions for making all of those 60 trillion cells are contained in each of those cells, with the exception of red blood cells who have traded their DNA for hemoglobin. So we have the capacity in each cell to make our entire body. But with specialization and maturity, that breadth of instruction is lost and, no, not lost. It becomes inaccessible. It remains but is tied up in the DNA molecule that we no longer, that individual uh, areas of the body no longer have access to. And so when cells and parts of the body that cannot replicate themselves, brain, heart, kidney, certain other areas, die, there are no other cells that have the capacity to replace them and so function and sometimes life itself is lost. This deficit in our recuperative powers was the reason why the discovery of embryonic stem cells a couple of decades ago was met with such enthusiasm. Embryonic stem cells are pluripotent, that is, have a multiplicity of potencies. They can become a variety of different cells, and they can be cultured and grown to replace cells that have been lost from a patient, and so potentially to cure the disease. There are two great problems with using embryonic stem cells, stem cells which have prevented their introduction into the medical community at this point. The first is an ethical problem and that is that the embryo has to be destroyed in order to harvest the stem cells. That is to say, you're trading a potential life for a potential cure. The second problem is an immunological one, and that is that the cells that are cultured and grown are done so from an embryo and then transplanted into a waiting patient. As far as that patient's immune system is concerned, this is an alien being transplanted into it, and so the immune system attacks it Hence, the patient has to be treated with immunosuppressants with the attendant difficulties associated with that in perpetuity. If the patient's own adult cells could be made pluripotent again, could be brought back to their 
uh, naive state, their state of juvenility, then both of those problems would be solved. Shinya Yamanaka reasoned that if he could discover the genes that were expressed in embryonic stem cells and then express those same genes in adult, mature, specialized cells, he might be able to bring them back to a pluripotent state. This is no mean task. There were 24 such genes. And the situation, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is that the genetic information is carried along the length of the DNA molecule, a six foot long twisted ladder whose rails are made of sugar and, and phosphate, and whose three billion rungs are composed of bases tied together by hydrogen bonds. This molecule is crumpled, folded, tied up, knotted into a nucleus, which is about six microns in diameter, or about four millionths the length of the molecule that is encapsulated within it. So to get to the right part of the molecule, you have to go through a number of gyrations. You have to expose the right part of the DNA molecule. You have to untwist it. You have to cut the right uh, a series of bases to expose them for copying, and then the gene can be expressed. The gene, of course, is only a very small part of the molecule. Some 99% of the DNA molecule does not code for the proteins that make us up. Uh, it's often disparagingly referred to as junk DNA, though the word junk probably reflects more our state of ignorance than of, of nature's wastefulness. The other 1% codes for those roughly 22,000 genes that produce the roughly 100,000 proteins that run our body. How do you get to them? Well, the process of exposing, untwisting, cutting, uh, is done by a series of proteins, of which there are more than 2,000, that bind to the DNA molecule and govern its replicative activities. Those proteins are called transcription factors, and it is on those that Dr. Yamanaka focused. His goal was to discover the transcription factors that could bring about pluripotency in adult specialized cells. And to do so, he needed two tools. First, he needed cells in, from the adult that were highly active because he needed a foment of activity with which to work. And so he, he chose skin fibroblasts, which make collagen, the most common protein in the body. It lines gut, blood vessels, tendons, ligaments, and so on. Secondly, he needed markers that would become visible only when the genes that he was seeking to express had become expressed so that he would know that he had succeeded. With these two tools, he was then in a position working with the many people whose image you just saw in his laboratory to begin experimenting with cocktails of transcription factors to see which ones might induce pluripotency in adult skin fibroblasts. To the astonishment of the medical community, and at first I must say the disbelief of the medical community, uh, a disbelief which Dr. Yamanaka overcame by expressing all of his raw data to the scientific world and saying, try it yourself, and many people did and they all succeeded. Uh, he found that a cocktail of just four transcription factors of the couple of thousand that are available was sufficient to induce pluripotency in adult skin fibroblasts. This was a discovery of monumental proportions. It's widely accepted as the most important discovery in the history of stem cell research. It was recently described in a book written by Francis Collins, who's the director of the National Institutes of Health, as one of the most important discoveries in the history of genetics. In the four years since Dr. Yamanaka made his discovery in humans, it was five years ago in mice, four years ago in humans, he has won, to my knowledge, 10 major international awards, including those that are commonly referred to as the Asian Nobel, the Baby Nobel, and the Pre-Nobel. Um, and you should see the odds in Las Vegas on this year's Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. And to that series today, we add the Kyoto Prize, which we refer to as the Super Nobel. Um, <laughs> I should also mention that when Dr. Yamanaka made his presentation in Kyoto last November 10th, it is in an opulent hall in the Takaragaike Center in the north part of Kyoto, and the hall has a seating capacity of 3,000. When Dr. Yamanaka's name was announced, 8,000 people registered to hear his lecture. 
we have the privilege of this much more intimate setting in order to hear Dr. Yamanaka present his research on induced pluripotent stem cells, the principles of mechanism and application to regenerative medicine. Please welcome Dr. Yamanaka. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Tom, for the very detailed introduction of my work. I think I can skip my talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Inamori and Inamori Foundation, and also Dr. Weber and San Francisco State University for having such a great opportunity for me. I'm so, so pleased. And also, I'd like to use this opportunity to express my uh, sincere gratitude to people in the States for your uh, support and friendship uh, about uh, the national uh, disaster uh, which is now happening in Japan. Uh, before I came here, uh, when I was still in Japan, I saw uh, TV news showing that a group of students here uh, in San Diego uh, having a, a banner saying Ganbare uh, Nippon, which means hang in there, Japanese people. I, I was almost in uh, tears. And yesterday at Point Roma, I saw, I met those students. So I was very, very pleased. I uh, uh, got a photo with them, so I'm very looking forward to having it. So uh, uh, let me move to my uh, presentation. Uh, can I have my last slide, please? Oh, I should do this by myself. Okay. Uh, I hope. So, uh, so as you, uh, uh, I think the video uh, mentioned, I started my career as an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, however, um, unfortunately, I found myself not good at surgeon at all. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, tried to be when I was doing a residency, when I was very young, uh, I tried to be an assist, assistant of my boss, of my mentor, uh, during his uh, surgery. But instead of calling me as an assistant, he often called me as a resistance. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I gave up. <laughs> and I decided to do uh, basic research. <laughs> so uh, I uh, tried to come to the States. I read uh, Nature, Science, and Cell to find the position. I wrote uh, many letters, uh, more than 20 letters, to uh, many uh, scientists and institutes in the States. Well, uh, most of the scientists were not brave enough to hire me. Of course, I didn't have any experience in molecular biology. I was a failed uh, orthopedic uh, surgeon. Uh, only one ex exception was Gladstone Institute. I got an um, uh, offer letter from uh, Gladstone, so I decided to there was no choice. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to go to San Francisco to become a, a postdoc at Gladstone Institute in San Francisco. Uh, between 93 to 97, I did my uh, postdoc. So this was my boss, uh, Tom Inerarity. 
This is the guy who was brave enough to hire me. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, this is a picture uh, we took together in 1995. Uh, the main purpose of this slide is to show you that I used to have more hairs. <laughs> <laughs> At Gladstone, I really had a great time uh, at Gladstone and in San Francisco. Uh, all my family, my wife, Chika, uh, uh, my daughters, Miki and Mika, uh, lived together in San Francisco. They grew up in San Francisco, so we really enjoyed the life in San Francisco. And uh, during these three years, I learned two important things. Uh, which is uh, uh, VW and NAT1. What is VW? This is uh, <laughs> Dr. Mary, who is here today. Uh, he was the director of the Gladstone Institute of Cardiovascular Disease. He then became uh, the president. He is now uh, uh, president of Emeritus. Uh, VW is what he taught us, postdoc. Uh, he said, in order to succeed as a scientist, you have to keep VW in mind all the time. He had, he still had VW car, but in this case, v, VW means uh, vision and hard work. <laughs> he told us that in order to succeed, you have to have a clear vision and then you just have to hard very, work very hard. Well, as a, a Japanese, we know how to work very hard, <laughs> but uh, many Japanese uh, tend to forget uh, our long vision. So this VW is a really uh, very important uh, teach from uh, Dr. Mary for the last uh, 20, 20 years. The other thing is not one. This is a scientific uh, name, a name of a new gene which I identified during my uh, postdoc training. So uh, when I was doing my postdoc, I met uh, I started using ESLs, embryonic stem cells. As you heard from uh, uh, Tom, uh, Tom Scott, ESLs are derived from mouse or human embryos. It was first derived from mouse embryos uh, in 1981, uh, more than 20 years ago. ES cells have two important properties. The first one is their rapid proliferation. We can expand ES cells as much as we want if we have enough money and space. The second most important property is so-called pluripotency. From ES cells, you can make virtually all types of cells, more than 300 types of cells that exist in our body. By mixing these two uh, properties, by using mouse or human ES cells, at, at least in theory, we can prepare uh, any types of somatic cells, mouse or human somatic cells, in any amount, in large amount, at any time. And I found uh, one gene, which I later uh, found essential in this second uh, property, pluripotency, and that was not one. I, uh, I didn't intend to identify genes which are important in ES cells. I first, uh, because the institute was Gladstone Institute of Cardiovascular Disease, I, inte I intended to identify genes which are uh, uh, important in atherosclerosis. But uh, it was just a kind of accidentally identified 
NAT1, which is important in uh, ESL's uh, pluripotency. So, uh, in 1997, uh, we decided to uh, go home, go back to Japan, but uh, Tom Minerality was kind enough to allow me to continue the research about NAT1 uh, back in Japan. However, after going back to Japan, I became sick. Uh, the name of the disease is PAD, which is now uh, very uh, famous. Uh, PAD stands for post-America depression. <laughs> So when I was in San Francisco, I was very, very happy. Uh, I was just enjoying science. But after I went back to Japan, uh, everything uh, had changed. Scientific environment had changed. So many things changed. But for example, uh, uh, I brought three mice. Uh, knockout mice from Gladstone Institute to uh, Osaka. Uh, in the beginning, I had only three mice. I named uh, one mice, one mouse, Tom. <laughs> the other uh, mouse, Kami, <laughs> who is the uh, uh, name of, uh, of the wife of Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but after a month, I had 20 mice. After a year, I had 200 mice. <laughs> and back in San Francisco, we had some technicians who took care of our mice. So all I had to do was just to uh, do experiments on mice. But in Japan, I had to take care of those 200 or more mice all by myself. <laughs> so I was not sure whether I was a scientist or just a, a, a mouse owner. <laughs> <laughs> so that was only one of many reasons, uh, but I suffered from serious uh, depression, PAD. So I was about to quit science uh, around uh, year 2000. So I was about to go back to clinics, although I was not so good at uh, uh, surgery, but I thought uh, I, may, I still may help patients by being in clinics. However, very luckily, two things happened which rescued me from PAD. Another reason of my PAD is that uh, many of my colleagues, I was in a medical school in Osaka, uh, so all of my colleagues were patients. And uh, often they told me that, Shinya, uh, you stop doing that uh, weird experiments using weird uh, mouse cells. You should do something more related to medicine, more, rela more related to human diseases. That was another reason. However, in 1998, Dr. Jamie Thompson in Wisconsin, he generated, he reported gener the generation of human embryonic stem cells, human ES cells. Up to this point, we only had mouse ES cells. But this year, he generated human ES cells, which have the two same important properties, rapid proliferation and pluripotency. So because of human ES cells, now, at least in theory, we can make any uh, human somatic cells in large amount in any moment. That means we may be able to use human ES cells to help many patients. For example, we can make, uh, I'm sorry, we can make uh, like uh, dopaminergic neurons, uh, neural stem cells, cardiac myocytes from human ES cells in a large amount, then we can use those somatic cells to treat patients suffering from various diseases and injuries 
such as Parkinson disease, spinal cord injury, and cardiac failure. So it turned out that what I was doing, uh, ESL uh, biology, is can be very, very related to medicine. So that means I didn't have to change my uh, research. However, at the same time, as uh, uh, Tom mentioned, ES cells, human ES cells, have many challenges as well. Uh, we have to worry about immune rejection after transplantation. We have to use human embryos to generate uh, human ES cells. So many people still are against the usage of uh, human embryos and human ES cells. But, but nevertheless, the generation of uh, human ES cells was a, a great news to me. The other reason uh, uh, which rescued me from uh, PAD was my promotion. I got a new position as an associate professor at Nara Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. So oh, oh, I became my own laboratory for the first time. Uh, and as you can see, this institute was, uh, is still has a, a, a very, very good scientific environment. Uh, their buildings are very well equipped. They have many, many uh, good scientists. They have relatively good scientific fundings. And but what's most important is that they have many, many good graduate students. Uh, in Japan, uh, all the schools begin in April. So we just start, started yesterday. <laughs> That's why my daughters uh, could not come this time. So I went to this university in uh, December. And in uh, five months, in uh, April, uh, uh, new graduate students will come. Approximately 120 new students uh, every year will, uh, will come to this uh, university from many uh, colleges and uh, graduate schools from all over Japan. And we have approximately 20 uh, PIs, principal investigator, investigators, including me. And in every April, there was a competition among 20 PIs to have to attract students. It was students' choice. <laughs> it's not PIs' choice. So I was very worried. I was the newest PI. I was the youngest PI. I was the least famous PI. And I was only an associate professor. Most of the PI were full professor, very, very famous professor. So I was not sure at all whether any students would join my lab. Since this is a, a, a graduate school, if I don't have any graduate students, I will be in, in uh, big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought very hard, and I, 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 I thought, well, uh, what I could do at this moment was to have a clear vision of my own laboratory to attract uh, uh, students. Well, I was not able to have enough money. I was not able to enough publications. I didn't have any papers in science or nature, but I could have some clear vision. So that's what I did. And I made this as a, a, a long-term goal or a vision of my uh, own laboratory. So or as I mentioned, ES cells, human ES cells have a huge potential. However, they have uh, many uh, challenges as well. So or I thought my vision is to overcome those challenges of human embryonic stem cells by 
making uh, ES-like stem cells, not from embryos, but from uh, somatic cells of patients, like skin cells, by means of reprogramming. Uh, so in April, April 2011 uh, years ago, uh, 120 patients, not patients, 120 uh, students uh, came to NARA, and we had an opportunity, like, just like this, in which each PI can uh, 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 introduce their laboratory, their work, to 120 newcomers to attract uh, those students. So uh, in front of 120 uh, students, I talked about this uh, vision, kind of dream. <laughs> I uh, told them, uh, this is my dream. Uh, but of course, I knew how this guy how difficult this would be. I knew it would take 20 years, 30 years, or longer. I knew that. However, I didn't tell that to my students. <laughs> <laughs> I just tell them how wonderful it is if we can make this. <laughs> and it works. <laughs> I got uh, two wonderful students, uh, PhD students. I'm sorry. Uh, Yoshimi Tokuzawa, Kazu Takahashi. And also, I got uh, a new technician, uh, Tomoko Ichisaka. Tomoko was a graduate of Kagoshima University, so same as uh, Dr. Inamori. So I got a uh, very small but uh, wonderful team in 2000. With these uh, young people, I uh, started uh, this project. So all we need is uh, hard work to make this happen. So oh, the question is whether this is really possible or not. Skin cells and ES cells are very different in morphology, in function. They are totally different. Can we ever convert skin cells back into ES-like stem cells? Well, for a long time, uh, this is what uh, most biologists believed. This book was published uh, in 1893 by uh, uh, Dr. Wiseman, in which he said, uh, only germ cells has the whole blueprint which is necessary to create our body. Only germ cells. In all other somatic cells, they are either uh, lost or uh, terminally uh, inactivated. So it was uh, more than 100 years ago, and it took a very long time to uh, deny this uh, theory. In uh, 1962, uh, it was uh, Dr. Sir John Garden who showed us, who, 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 who told us that uh, Dr. Wiseman's theory is not correct. Uh, John Gordon actually made uh, tadpole from intestine by using nuclear transfer. Let me explain his uh, experiment a bit more. So this is what he did. He took from an adult uh, frog, he took uh, intestinal cells. Uh, so this cell is uh, totally, completely differentiated. He, he took out uh, nucleus from uh, intesti in intestinal cell 
He then transferred the nucleus from intestine to, uh, 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 to an oocyte from another frog. Then, by stimulating this uh, uh, nuclear transferred uh, oocyte, he was able to uh, generate uh, tadpole. So this simple but technically very demanding experiment clearly uh, demonstrated that even in the nucleus of intestine, all the genetic information, all the uh, blueprint, which is required to generate at least tadpole, still exist. And in 1997, the same experiment was uh, recapitulated, uh, was repeated in mammals, in sheep. So this is the famous sheep dolly. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sa Ian Wilmot, he succeeded making a new sheep from uh, a nucleus of uh, uh, mammalia uh, from uh, 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 adult uh, donor cell. So from these two important uh, experiments, we knew that most of our cells have the same blueprint, have the same complete genetic information which is required to have a complete uh, organism. Another important finding was done by uh, 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 several scientists, including uh, this one. So Walter, he showed that by introducing one gene, one transcription factor, so-called master regulator, uh, he was able to convert in fry antenna to an eye by just introducing one transcription factor. This is another example, this is another demonstration of uh, uh, as same as the previous two studies showing that even eye and antenna has the same genetic information, blueprint. By adding just one transcription factor, you can convert antenna to I. So from these experiments, I made, uh, an I made a hypothesis to uh, achieve my uh, goal, to convert skin cells to ES cells. So we learned that skin cells and ES cells should have the same blueprint. If we identified some uh, master regulatory gene transcription factor or uh, uh, bookmarks, uh, which is required to make ES cells, by introducing such bookmarks into skin cells, by introducing such uh, master regulatory genes or transcription factors into skin cells, we may be able to combat skin cells into ES-like stem cells. So this was my hypothesis. So I proposed this hypothesis. I had a hard time to uh, get funded because uh, this hypothesis probably was too simple. But very luckily, uh, I got a scientific funding from Inamori Foundation in 2004. So this picture was taken uh, in 2004. Dr. Uh, Inamori uh, is in the center, and I am here. <laughs> I was a bit younger. <laughs> So I was very, very uh, happy when I received this scientific grant. So I was able to continue my research. 
Then, uh, with the help of those uh, young students, we were able to identify these uh, kind of bookmarks in ESLs. So these are transcription factors that play important roles in mouse ESLs. So we thought that these may be bookmarks for ESLs. Then, by uh, uh, putting those bookmarks into skin cells, uh, we actually, we indeed became able to generate ES-like cells directly from skin cells. We found that uh, what we need was the combination of four bookmarks. So any single factors, single bookmark cannot make this, was not able to make this. But when we tried combination, we found that uh, the combination of these four factors, OX3, SOX2, CMYK, and KRL4, can actually uh, convert skin cells back into ES-like cells. So we designated these new ES-like cells, IPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells. Well, I was using iMac uh, iPhone, at that time we didn't have any iPad, so I decided to make I uh, in a small letter, small case, <laughs> so IPS cells. So we reported mouse IPS cells in 2006 and human IPS cells in 2007. Uh, the same four factors can make both mouse and human IPS cells. So it was these young scientists who generated IPS cells. It was not me. I was just uh, sitting down in my office. <laughs> <laughs> these uh, three young, talented scientists did all the experiments. So I'm very, very grateful to them. They are kind of IPS trio, Yoshimi, Kazutoshi, and Tomoko. Uh, Kazutoshi and Tomoko are still with me in uh, Kyoto. So uh, these uh, uh, three people are uh, very, very uh, important to me, to my life. They are uh, uh, as important as my daughters. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, of course, I have my wife here. <laughs> so. She is more important. <laughs> so, this is what we are now uh, doing, actually doing, uh, with the help of. Uh, Kyoto University Hospital and many other hospitals in Kyoto and also uh, in San Francisco at Gladstone, we are making IPS cells from many, many uh, patients. So all we need is a, a skin biopsy, small skin biopsy. Now we can make uh, IPS cells from a single hair, although the efficiency is uh, still low, we, we, we can make IPS cells from a single hair. So in the future, we may avoid uh, this procedure. However, uh, for some people like me, a single hair means a lot. <laughs> so uh, I, would, I would use skin biopsy. But now, actually, more recently, we, can, we become able to make IPS cells from, uh, from, uh, uh, from peripheral blood sample only one ml or two ml, that's all we need to make IPS cells. So, but now, uh, uh, skin biopsy is the most common procedure. So from, from a tiny skin fragment, we can make a dish of skin fibroblasts. 
And by introducing those four or three factors, we can convert these skin fibroblasts into uh, iPS cells, which are almost indistinguishable from human ES cells. And uh, once they become iPS cells, uh, they can proliferate almost infinitely, as much as we, we, we want. And then, by treating these iPS cells with like, some cytokines or growth factors, we can convert these iPS cells into many uh, different types of somatic cells, uh, such as uh, beating uh, cardiac myocytes. So uh, this was actually uh, very uh, surprising. These, these cells were skin cells just a few months ago, but they were now beating. So when I first saw this, my uh, uh, heart synchronized. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we would like to do with this technology. Again, we are making iPS cells from, I'm sorry, from patients suffering from various diseases and injuries. Uh, like patients suffering from uh, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig disease, who cannot uh, move. But uh, although his motor neurons are very bad, uh, his or her skin cells are just normal. So uh, all we need is, again, a tiny amount of skin cells. We can convert uh, skin cells into iPS cells. We can expand iPS cells as much as we want. Then we can make uh, iPS cells. Uh, we can convert iPS cells to motor neurons. We have already succeeded uh, making motor neurons from uh, ALS patients. Uh, we can also make uh, cardiac myocytes. We are now trying to make hepatocytes and beta cells, although it is technically still very difficult to make functional hepatocytes or beta cells from iPS cells or ES cells. So again, we can make, uh, we can have uh, like motor neurons from ALS patients. And what is important is that although the patient is already sick, so his motor neuron is already uh, sick. However, motor neurons we generate through iPS cells are not sick yet. So they are equivalent to motor neurons when this patient was like a baby. So that means we can now, uh, patients or scientists can have uh, cells uh, which from the patients, uh, and in the patients, the cells are already sick, but by using iPS cells, we can uh, prepare uh, cells before becoming sick. So we have two major uh, usages of those cells. The first one is uh, cell therapy, regenerative medicine. We may be able to transplant those uh, healthy cells back into patients in order to recover the uh, function of uh, the patient. However, uh, this application is, uh, has many, many challenges. We really have to double check the safeness, safety of transplanted cells. Uh, the other application is in drug discovery. So again, we can have cells before becoming sick. And by culturing those cells, we may be able to recapture disease process. Indeed, many scientists have already shown that we can recapture disease process by using iPS cell-derived uh, motor neurons or cardiac myocytes. So by using that disease model, we can uh, have better understanding of the disease uh, 
mechanisms, and also we can use those cells in high throughput screening of chemicals, trying to identify new uh, effective drugs. And also, uh, we can have large amount of human cardiac myocytes, either from healthy donors or either from patients suffering from some cardiac diseases. We can also have hepatocytes in a large amount, human hepatocytes. So we should be able to use those cells in toxicology to predict uh, side effect of new uh, drug candidates. So uh, this in vitro application, in uh, pharmaceutical application, it's just around the corner. Some companies are already selling uh, cardiac myocytes derived from human iPS cells. So uh, this in vitro application is, is coming very soon. As a matter of fact, uh, this map shows the location of stem cell institute in the world. Uh, I hope you can see there are many uh, triangles. Uh, I think I believe this is San Diego. And in most of these stem cell institutes, iPS cells are uh, being used. When I went to San Francisco uh, uh, several months ago, I found a car which, not, which was not BW, which was uh, a Mini Cooper. <laughs> but, but I found, <laughs> I'm sorry, the plate is IPSL. <laughs> so I was very surprised and pleased. This is not, this is not my car. <laughs> this is somebody else's car. So I am now working uh, at two places, one in Kyoto. We now have this uh, beautiful building, uh, Center for IPS Cell Research and Application, Kyoto University. And also, I also work at Gladstone Institute. They have moved, we have moved to a, a new building as well. We now have a beautiful building in the Mission Bay uh, campus in the uh, latest campus of UCSF. So again, uh, I used to be a uh, physician. I uh, tried to help patients by doing uh, surgery. However, uh, I was not able to help patients by doing surgery. But very luckily, I had an opportunity to meet this new technology, iPSL technology. However, so far, we haven't been able to help any patients at all using uh, this new technology. So oh, my goal, my vision now is to realize those applications which I uh, introduced today uh, to bring those technology to patients. So uh, the Kyoto Prize is a huge encouragement for me and for my uh, team to continue our effort to make that happen. So again, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Inamori and Inamori Foundation for uh, the Kyoto Prize and I'd like to express uh, my sincere thanks to these people in both Kyoto and also in San Francisco. In Kyoto, I have some strange uh, student, uh, like this guy. <laughs> this is a, a boy student, but he likes to wear kimono. <laughs> He, he is strange, but he works very hard, so he is, <laughs> I think he will be okay. <laughs> so, again, uh, one more time, I'd like to thank uh, people in the States for your support and friendship. Uh, 
uh, in this uh, very uh, special occasion. Uh, this uh, time, the disaster is something that we, we, we could not predict at all. As a scientist, I had, you know, I, I graduated from Kobe University and we had a, a terrible earthquake 15 years ago, but we had overcome that uh, disaster. But this time, uh, the degree of disaster is something uh, far beyond our uh, prediction. But, but I believe we, our country, uh, can overcome this uh, uh, national disaster again. But we do need your uh, continuous support and help, and we do need a strong leadership like Dr. Inamori, but I'm sure we will recover from this uh, uh, natural disaster. So thank you, very much, thank you very much again, and thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>